Welcome back to A Tale of Two Crowns, the gospel story throughout the scriptures. We are taking a walk to the cross of the Lord Jesus during Easter season like we have never seen it before. What an exciting journey we are on as we look back at the Old Testament, which Jesus used to teach the disciples on the road to Emmaus all about himself. And we're seeing how Jesus is embedded in the stories of the Old Testament. All stories, many of them at least, and specifically the story of David. And that's why it's called A Tale of Two Crowns, as we see David's life and Christ's life together in these days of Jesus walking to the cross. We'll unpack that more today, even though we began last week. But what a privilege it is to see scripture in a new way, through panoramic pictures, through the power of story, as the Old Testament portrays the story of the gospel in astounding ways. And so this week we are looking at parallel stories. Again, so many pictures of Jesus as the Lamb of God, as the Lord, the sovereign Lord of all in the Old Testament. And so as we look at these parallel stories, it is Holy Week rediscovered for us this week. And it happens to be Holy Week for us here as we're taping this. We are on our Easter journey, but this is appropriate any time of the year as the cross and the resurrection should be in full view in our lives as believers. So from stories and scenes to powerful pictures of Christ, it is said that a picture is worth a thousand words. And if a picture is, then what is a moving picture worth? Well, there is no one better to tell us that secret than Cecil B. DeMille, the great storyteller of the scriptures in epic films that are still being seen today. As a young man, Cecil's dream was to make movies. It was the silent picture days, and he got on a train in the Midwest and headed west to Flagstaff, Arizona, hoping to make his first moving picture, which was a Western. When they got close to Flagstaff, there had been a snowstorm of all things, and the tracks were completely closed. And so he got off the train, got on another one, and said, take me as far west as you can take me. And that train went all the way to a little village called Hollywood, California. <laughs> and the rest is history. Yes, it's true. Flagstaff, Arizona would have been the Hollywood if not for that <laughs> snowstorm. And Cecil B. DeMille would make that little village of Hollywood become a world-renowned place through the movies that he would make there. In 1923, he had a dream to film the Ten Commandments. And he brought an army of workers who built a massive set in the California sand dunes. This is not the 1956 film that you and I know with Charlton Heston. This is the first Ten Commandments that Cecil B. DeMille made as a young man. He would make the last Ten Commandments as an old man, and it would be the last film that he made. This one in black and white, the one that you and I know in living color. Two stories of the Ten Commandments. And what a beautiful picture that is as we remember that the Lord is giving us the black and white images of the Old Testament and it's coming out in living colors. We see Christ on every single page. But nothing ever had been made. It was a massive set that they built with thousands of workers and extras. And here are some pictures from the film in black and white. They brought almost a thousand Jews from L.A., because Cecil B. DeMille wanted them to be extras in the film so that they could experience the exodus for themselves. Mm -hmm. Complete with a kosher kitchen on set so that they could uh, be completely kosher in the experience. I love that so much. But after filming, the whole set vanished. And this is exactly the place. Vanished mysteriously. And there were lots of rumors about it in the next decades. In fact, it came to be known as the Lost City of Cecil B. DeMille. It's still there today, almost to the Pacific Ocean in the sand dunes of Southern California. And in 1982, it became this man's dream, a filmmaker and reporter. He became obsessed with finding and unearthing this set. And so for the next 30 years, they would fight for permits and bring in archeologists from all over the world engineers and use science in order to unearth this great set. In the end, they dug up and displayed only a few pieces from that uh, great Ten Commandments set. 
It was massive and they couldn't bring up and dig up so many of the huge pieces, but they brought up enough that were buried in the sands of time in order to tell a living story of these two filmings of the Ten Commandments. Two stories in one. We can still see it today in HDR, by the way, <laughs> high definition. You can watch it and many people will this week. What an incredible story. The 1923 version in black and white, the 1956 version is bigger and better. In fact, this time they filmed it in Egypt, staying here at St. Catherine's Monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai, where Charlton Heston would uh, receive the Ten Commandments. A huge set bringing in tens of thousands of people to film it this time. In fact, it would be uh, Cecil B. DeMille's final film. Um, there was a man in a, in a rest home in California who desperately wanted to be an extra in this movie. And when they came back to Hollywood to film The Parting of the Red Sea, Cecil B. DeMille bought, brought him from the nursing home so that he could be in this film. And he is the old man who stumbles in the middle of the crossing of the Red Sea and they pick him up and put him on a pallet and carry him across. That is the actor who played Jesus in the greatest story ever told. And I love that Jesus is in the middle of the Red Sea crossing in the Ten Commandments movie. How cool mm -hmm. is that? Cecil B. DeMille always with a great vision. In fact, on set one day, he had to crawl up to look from the vantage point of the very top of this set so that he could get the shot he wanted and he had a heart attack. And they brought him down and he still finished filming this film. It would be the last film he would ever make. He had a great spiritual heritage from his mom and dad who taught him the scriptures. He loved the Old Testament and the New Testament. He made more epic films about the Bible than anybody else. And he said his goal was to highlight from the scriptures, the tremendous love of God for his people. And so today, as we think about the epic tale, not of Cecil B. DeMille, of God himself, who wrote it in black and white and then in living color, but it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. What is hidden beneath the surface of Holy Week? We're going to see two backdrops from the greatest story ever told. First, in the Old Testament, buried beneath the sands of time, we're going to dig deep and brush off these pieces to gaze upon the grand set design of Christ's work as he walks toward the cross. Again, the stories of the Old Testament picture for us the greater story of our salvation as Christ is unveiled in living color. And I told you last lesson that God had spoken a word to me about this series. And it was just this phrase, and wonder awaits. And I am learning that every time we open the scriptures, wonder awaits. I love how Tony Robinson has said it. You have that quote there in your lesson. The scriptures are woven in a grand design with a compelling purpose, the heralding of the supreme work of the Messiah. So let's see it again, and in some ways, I think we'll see it for the first time as the Holy Spirit teaches us the wonder of his word. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this beautiful display uh, of the Old Testament, which feels black and white to us sometimes. We don't quite see the significance of how it ties in with all of the New Testament. And then the New Testament comes in living color, and we see Christ uh, in such a striking way. Thank you for unpacking for us in this study how Christ is in the stories of the Old Testament. And I pray that these stories would just pop off of the scripture pages for us in a new way. Father, show us not only your love for all the world as you brought your son Jesus into the scene in order to set us free, but Father, help us to have a compelling desire to follow after him on the way as he goes to the cross, as he's buried, as he is raised again from the dead. Father, may your grace and glory be seen in such dramatic ways as you open the scriptures to us now in Jesus' name, amen. Well, there are three things we're going to look at today as we consider Jesus making that final journey to the cross. And the first thing that I want you to see is that he was sojourning toward sacrifice. But 
God had put into his word a way for us to be reconnected with him, starting in Genesis. And Genesis 3 actually gives a prophecy of Jesus coming. But I want you to understand that this journey began for Jesus when he left heaven and came to earth. It started for God when he set into motion a way for us to return to the garden again. So consider that when sin separated us from God's presence after Eden, God made a dwelling place built on sacrifice where sin could be covered and communion restored. And that place was the tabernacle and then the temple. But I want you to see there's actually two tabernacles and two temples. So just as God dwelt with his people in the wilderness in a tabernacle or a tent, so Christ dwelt among us in a tabernacle or tent of the human flesh. This is exactly what John said in John 1.14. Look at it with me. The word became flesh and made his dwelling, literally tabernacled, among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The reason that John says that we saw the glory of Christ is because just as the glory of God was over and in the tabernacle and temple, so when we saw Christ come on the scene and he tabernacled among us, we beheld his glory just as in the tabernacle. So there are two tabernacles. As God's presence then settled in a more permanent dwelling, the temple in Jerusalem, Christ would come to dwell in a living temple, a permanent body through his death and resurrection. It's one of the first things that Christ said to the religious leaders when he cleansed the temple in John 2. He said, destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. What temple was he talking about? The temple of his body. And so he tabernacled among us in flesh. But when he rose from the grave, he had a new body. And that would be the temple. In fact, that temple would indwell us. You and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. This was always the way that God wanted to reestablish his dwelling place with his people. Look at what Ezekiel 37, 26 and 27 says. I will put my temple among them forever. I will dwell among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. We'll even see this at the end of the age. Look at Revelation 21, 22 and the la one of the last things said about all eternity for us as believers in Jesus. I saw no temple, John says, in the city, the new Jerusalem, for the Lord Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So in the tabernacle and temple, we see the greater story of the communing of Christ coming to dwell with us. But there are also two Elijahs and two Elishas in picturing for us the greater story of Christ. Now remember, Elijah was a prophet calling people to repentance with God's mantle and a leather belt who spent much time in the wilderness of Judea calling down fire from heaven. You can read his story in 1 Kings 16 through 18 and 2 Kings 1 and 2. John the Baptist was a prophet in the spirit of Elijah, calling people to repentance, Luke 117 tells us, mantled before birth and wearing a leather belt. The Gospels literally tells us that, whose ministry was in the wilderness of Judea and he was expecting fire from heaven, Matthew 3, 1 through 12. Now Elisha came right after Elijah and was called forth to minister by Elijah. Elisha worked many miracles, including multiplying loaves to feed many with much left over and raising the dead, as well as healing lepers and opening eyes to see. You can read his story in 2 Kings 2 and following. In fact, he asked for a double portion of blessing from Elijah when Elijah was taken to heaven. And did he get it? Yeah. Elisha has doubled the miracles of Elijah to the detail. I love that. Do any of those miracles sound familiar, though? Christ came right after John and was called forth to minister by John. Christ worked many miracles, including multiplying loaves for many with much left over, raising the dead, healing lepers, and opening blind eyes to see. Did you ever see that before? Elisha in his miracles, multiplying loaves to feed many. Now, Elisha fed 100, Christ would feed 5,000 and with kids and, and, and spouses, probably 25,000 and then 4,000 at another time. But isn't that incredible how Elisha was doing the works of Christ? 
in the Old Testament in black and white, and Christ would come in living color. So in Elijah and Elisha, we see the greater story of the coming of Christ. Now let's look at two Jordan crossings, because the children of Israel crossed the Jordan, coming out of their wilderness wanderings, and the first thing they do is take Jericho, but there are actually two Jordan crossings. So God's people were set apart and prepared at the east side of the Jordan River near Jericho to enter the promised land in three days, Joshua 1 through 3 tells us, crossing from death of the desert to new life. And they would cross on the east side to the west side. Here's the Israelite camp. Here's Jericho. But I want you to see as well that Christ was set apart and prepared to enter his ministry in the promised land at the east side of the Jordan River near Jericho. The scriptures tell us at Bethany beyond the Jordan where he was baptized by John. John 1, 28 through 35. So Christ literally will cross, come over to the east side, be baptized by John, cross the Jordan again, just as the children of Israel did at Jericho. Isn't that cool? In, again, two Jordan crossings. Now, at the beginning of Holy Week, Jesus passed through Jericho on his way to the cross, where over three days he passed from death to life. Luke 18, 35. So this is what I want you to see, though, about the Jordan River. The Jordan is a life and death river with living water coming down from the peaks of Mount Hermon. That's where it starts in the north and flowing into the Dead Sea in the south where it ends. It begins as a living river. It flows all the way and it dumps into a dead sea. Life to death. When God's people crossed the Jordan, the waters of life were rolled back all the way to the small town of Adam on one side, 20 miles upriver, and completely cut off from the waters of death flowing to the Dead Sea on the other. Now, I want you to see that in Joshua's account, Joshua 3.16. The water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. This is what I want you to see. Through Christ's death and resurrection, he restored the waters of life lost at Adam mm -hmm. and cut off the death that mm -hmm. flowed as a result. You cannot make this stuff up. No. Mm -hmm. This is literally in God's word, every detail. I love that so much. But wait, there's more. There's two Joshuas. Remember, Joshua, or Yeshua, whose name means salvation, led God's people into the promise of a new future and freedom from their lives of slavery in Egypt at Jericho. Jesus, whose Hebrew name is Yeshua, Joshua, meaning salvation, would pass through Jericho on his way to bringing all people the promise of a new future and freedom for them from their lives of slavery to sin and death. And so on the Friday before Good Friday, Jesus passes through Jericho and he is marching on mission. And let's see what he does there because there were two who were lost and then found. Zacchaeus, whose name means pure and clean, was given full victory over sin when Christ called him out of a tree because the Lord was on his way to climb a tree to bring him forgiveness. Don't miss the picture of that. Now we all have the same problem as Zacchaeus. We are too short. Mm -hmm. Look at what Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Zacchaeus call, uh, God call, or Christ calls Zacchaeus out of that tree, goes to his house, Zacchaeus is forgiven, he gives restitution, his life is completely restored, and his name, pure and clean, is reinstated to him again because Christ is on his way to the cross to cover Zacchaeus' sin and your sin and my sin. But there was another man that day whose life was completely changed. His name was Bartimaeus, whose name means honorable and highly prized. He was seen by Jesus and given fresh vision when Christ healed his blindness his response was to follow Christ on the way. 
Luke tells us. On the way, that phrase just jumped out to me. On the way where? To the cross. And it reminds me of what Hebrews 12, 2 says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. It says Bartimaeus literally threw his cloak to the ground and followed Christ on the way. And I think he went all the way with him from Jericho through that valley of the shadow of death of the canyon, the Judean wilderness, all the way to Bethany and then to Jerusalem where Jesus would give his life for you and for me. And what I want you to see in that is that your victory and vision will never be clear and complete until you glimpse the cross and glory in the cross. And I want to remind you this week as you worship for Holy Week that you do that and that you start at Jericho where Jesus started his Holy Week in this story because it's so profound. In the crossing of the Jordan and Joshua in Jericho, we see the greater story of the conquering work of Christ. So my question to you today is what walls does Yeshua want to tear down in your life so he can give you full victory and fresh vision? From Friday to Good Friday, Yeshua, Joshua, was on the march to vanquish death and bring life because he is sojourning toward sacrifice. The second thing that I want you to see as he moves toward Jerusalem is the sovereign city, the city of the great king. That's what it's called in Psalm 48, 1 and 2. The city of our God, his holy mountain is Mount Zion, the city of the great king. And here I want you to see two sets of kingly processions, not just one triumphal entry. There will be two sets of triumphal entry. So as kings from the east or magi came to Jerusalem seeking Christ at his birth, now kings or officials would come to see Christ at his death in Jerusalem. Pilate coming from the west with the military might of Rome, a thousand soldiers accompanying him, Herod Antipas coming from the north with a regal entourage, entourage in full regalia, coming with great strength. But both of them coming to Jerusalem at that very time because Jesus was going to be there. And they knew that things were getting stirred up. Isn't that crazy? Kings came to find Christ in Jerusalem at his birth. Kings came, officials came to see him the week of his death. But there's another set I want you to see. In his first triumphal entry, Christ came as the Prince of Peace, gentle and riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. But in his second triumphal entry at the end of the age, he will ride into Jerusalem on a white horse and the kings of the earth will come to Jerusalem to see him and bow down, Zechariah 14 and Psalm 72, 11 tells us. Now, there's something that we don't always clearly see in the triumphal entry of Christ, and so I want to point it out to you. There were two donkeys, two. Fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, Jesus rides into Jerusalem as king, not on one, but two donkeys. Look at what Zechariah 9, 9 says. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, this is what Jesus told his disciples to do in Matthew 21, 2 and 7. Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there and her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them too donkeys not just one our flannel graph sunday school stories they didn't keep that that wasn't in there uh, it's even high, hard to find a slide because there, jesus is writing on a donkey but there were two why well jesus rode both a donkey and its little one lowering himself to the humblest place the son of god on the son of a donkey mm. But I think there's something else that's hidden in scriptures that we can unearth, dig up, and um, dust off to see. And this is incredible to me. He was also coming as the Lamb of God to redeem our stubborn bent of sin. Think donkey. Donkeys are known for their stubbornness. Now, hidden in the Old Testament, 
in a story that's very familiar to you is a little verse that I think explains this. The children of Israel at Mount Sinai have been unfaithful to the Lord, bowing down to a golden calf while Moses has gone up to get the Ten Commandments. He comes back, he's so angry, he throws those commandments down. The people are disciplined and repent, and Moses has to go back up on Mount Sinai and get another set of Ten Commandments. So see, there are two Ten Commandment movies. So Moses goes back up, and in Exodus 34, the Lord unpacks for him uh, some very important instructions that he gives. And he gives him the Ten Commandments. He tells him who he is. I am the Lord, the Lord of compassion, the Lord who is gracious, who doesn't hold anger. He goes through all of this. He tells Moses numerous times in the next verses, tell my people, you better not bow down, bow down to idols again. Do not bow down to idols. He says it like three times. And then there's this little verse in such a profound, important passage. And this is what it says in Exodus 34, 20. Redeem the firstborn donkey with a lamb. But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Just out of the blue. I mean, the Lord is saying some heavy things and all of a sudden comes a donkey verse with a lamb. And I want you to see this clearly today. Why is this so important? Because the firstborn was redeemed to the Lord. It was given to the Lord. But the Lord clearly said, and when it comes to donkeys, you are to redeem that donkey with a lamb. And if you don't redeem it, break its neck. Why? Because in its stubbornness, it will go the wrong way and it will eventually be destroyed. And you and I are those donkeys. We are either redeemed by the Lamb of God or we better have our neck broken because the stubbornness of our neck, and neck is always a sign in Scripture of stubbornness, will get us into all kinds of death and destruction. And so I want you to see in this story there are also two lambs Two lambs will enter on that triumphant day, Sunday, the 10th of Nisan. In fact, it's known as the Day of the Lamb. And Jesus, the Lamb of God, born in Bethlehem, joined the procession as the Passover lamb for that year was taken from the temple flocks born in Bethlehem and led into Jerusalem. Every year they would have this lamb parade on the 10th of Nisan. And so literally the perfect lamb who had been chosen to die for the nation's sin as the national sacrifice would be led on that same road, on that same day, at that same time into Jerusalem. This perfect lamb passed through the sheep gate to the temple where it would await death as the sacrifice for God's people. Jesus, the perfect lamb, would pass through the sheep gate this day and throughout the week as he awaited his sacrificial death. For God's people. Two lambs, two donkeys in the triumphal procession, two lambs in the triumphal procession. But what else happened on that Sunday? There were two weeping prophets. Just as Jeremiah wept over Jerusalem and its coming judgment for rejecting God in Lamentations 2, 11 and 12, during Holy Week, Jesus wept over Jerusalem and its coming judgment for rejecting him as Messiah. Look at what Luke 19, 41 through 44 says. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will encircle you on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You could overlay that passage back into Jeremiah's life and see Jeremiah weeping over Jerusalem, saying the same thing as Jerusalem would be destroyed in Jeremiah's time. And after Jesus died and was resurrected and ascended to heaven, just a short 40 years later, Jerusalem would be destroyed in this same way. I want you to see that both Jeremiah and Jesus would be arrested, beaten, attacked by mobs, ridiculed, threatened by leaders, and put into jail awaiting judgment because they declared God's word and called the people to repent and return. There were two weeping prophets, and again, the story of Jesus and the life of Jeremiah is seen in living color. And then there are two temple cleansings. Did you know that? Jesus cleansed the temple twice. Again, we don't see this in our Sunday school flannel graph. We will always think of it as one time, but it was twice. Jesus cleansed the temple during his first Passover of ministry in John 2, 12 through 17. 
And then Jesus cleansed the temple during his last Passover of ministry in Matthew 21, 12 through 13, three years apart. And the thing I want you to see in that is that the sacrifice lamb never forgot he was sovereign Lord, redeeming and ruling always. But please understand this as well. From first to last, Christ cares about the content of our hearts. It was the first thing he did when he went in and said, why are you making my father's house a den of thieves? My father's house, my house shall be called a house of prayer for the nations. And I am so grateful for the women in this room who are prayer warriors and who daily and weekly lift up our prayers before the throne of grace that we will find mercy and help in time of need. Christ could not take what was happening in God's house and he cleansed it at the beginning and he cleansed it at the end. And so my question to you is, how is the condition of the temple of your heart this holy week? Is there some cleansing to be done? Because that application should be a part of your holy week this year and every year. There are two temple cleansings. And then I want you to see a tale of two crowns. A tale of two crowns. As the Lord, as the sacrifice lamb cleansing the temple, would then become the sovereign one who would be crowned with many crowns. David himself will um, demonstrate this in his life. And David is even in the birth story of the Lord Jesus. I want you to see these verses in Luke 1, 30 through 33. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And then to the shepherds was given this message by the angel. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. But I want you to see that not only would David and Christ rule, and they will in the coming millennial kingdom, but David not only reflected the reign of Jesus, but also the redeeming work of Jesus in a way we may have missed because there's a story within a story. Jesus was not only the son of David, but would bear the sin of David as well as ours as he made his way to the cross. Now focus here with me because this is deep, but it gets really, really good. As Eve was tempted when she saw forbidden fruit and sinned, David was tempted when he saw Bathsheba bathing and sinned. The Lord judged sin with a sentence of death and both Adam and Eve as well as David experienced death through a son. Sin brought death as Cain murdered his brother Abel and Absalom murdered his brother Amnon. Both Cain and Absalom were banished from the presence of their father because of sin. You can see those stories in Genesis 3 and 4 and 2 Samuel 11 through 13. So during this part of Holy Week, Jesus took upon himself the sin which began with Adam in the Garden of Eden and traced the steps of David to the Garden of Gethsemane as he carried the weight of sin for us all. Judgment for David's sin with Bathsheba came through Absalom's rebellion that sent David fleeing Jerusalem to the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. And this story within a story presents in striking detail a picture of the suffering, death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah in three days, which follows chronologically the gospel accounts. You can read it in 2 Samuel 15 verse 10 through chapter 20 verse 2. So I'm going to show it to you in some more striking detail now as we see Christ surrendering to sin. First sojourning toward sacrifice, then entering the sovereign city, which is the sovereign's city, and now surrendering to sin. What I'm about to tell you will happen on Thursday and Good Friday of Holy Week. And the first thing I want you to see is that there are two vantage points I found this fascinating and I never thought about it before. Both David and Christ experienced two telling vantage points as they left Jerusalem heading for Gethsemane. 
2 Samuel 15, 23 and 30, and John 18, verse 1. The first is this, both David and Jesus headed from Jerusalem to the Kidron Valley toward the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. The Kidron Valley is also called the Valley of Jehoshaphat and is the place of the last judgment, according to Joel 3, 12. So this is the valley between the city of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives where Gethsemane is called the place or the valley of Jehoshaphat and literally in the last days Christ will sit in this valley and judge the nations and this is the valley he crossed this is the valley and the place that he saw here David bears God's judgment for his sin and Christ bears the judgment for all sin while knowing that one day he will be judged the second vantage point is the garden of Gethsemane looks out on the golden gate of Jerusalem, the entrance of Israel's kings, and David looks back on a lost kingdom because of sin, while Christ looks ahead to an eternal kingdom as he covers sin's curse. At his second coming, the king of kings will enter Jerusalem through this same gate from the Mount of Olives. And I love that in Gethsemane, Christ could see that golden gate and be reminded that in the end, he will be king of kings if he can just hang on to take the crown of thorns and be the king of our curse as he goes to the cross. And then I want you to see there are two Gethsemanes. Both David and Jesus experienced the crushing weight of sin that began in one garden, Eden, surrendering to the Lord's will in another garden, Gethsemane. 2 Samuel 15, 23 through 25 tells David going to Gethsemane. Luke 22, 39 through 42 tells Christ going to Gethsemane. When you read David's account, you'll see that he went to the summit of the Mount of Olives. And even though it doesn't use the word Gethsemane, that's where it is. And then it will say he went a little over the summit, beyond the summit, and that is where the Garden of Gethsemane is. So this is how we see him tracing the steps of Christ before Christ comes here. Now, please understand this. Gethsemane pictures a place of crushing, as a Gethsemane is an olive press. So you'll see this is a Gethsemane in Israel today. And this is an up close as the olives are being pressed. In a Gethsemane, all olives are crushed beyond recognition and their life-giving oil is drained from them to bring sustenance and healing to others. Now, if you can see it, the olives, when they're pressed, come out in a blood red that flows down. Mm -hmm. And olives go through three pressing to get the very finest of oil. And you will see Christ pressed three times in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prays three times, each time being crushed in a greater and greater and greater way until he sweats drops of blood as the olive is being pressed to the limit in order to produce the oil of salvation for you and for me. What I want you to see in that is Christ learned obedience in a garden of trees, correcting Adam and Eve's disobedience in a garden of trees, then covering all of our disobedience, Adam's, David's, and ours, by dying on a tree. This is Gethsemane, and it was among these trees that Christ literally learned obedience. Why do I use that term? Because that's what Hebrews 5, 7, and 8 tells us. Listen to this. This is a verse about what Christ experienced in Gethsemane. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. So my question for you today is what is your Gethsemane? What is pressing you out of measure? And will you learn obedience from what you suffer in this place? If we had time today, we could go around the room and all of us would tell of Gethsemane moments in our lives. And there will be others coming. I have a Gethsemane this week. And there has been a crushing and a pressing in my life out of measure. And yet God has brought this message forth to give to you. And I pray that as you go through your Gethsemane, you'll ask yourself this profound question. Are you learning obedience here? What is it the Lord wants you to surrender to him? Not my will, but your will be done. What was it that crushed Christ beyond me measure? I think it was the cup of God's wrath. And I want you to see there are two cups of wrath. 
So in Gethsemane, David bore his own cup of wrath and judgment, carrying the pain and price of his own sin. And if you read the account of the sin with Bathsheba and then God's judgment through the prophet Nathan to David, you will see there were some severe consequences for this one sin. And I think it makes a greater picture for us of the consequences of all of our sin. But in Gethsemane, Christ asks for the cup of God's wrath and judgment to pass from him, then takes it for David and all of us. Look at what Isaiah 51, 22 says. This is what your sovereign Lord says. You are God who defends his people. See, I have taken out of your hands the cup that makes you stagger. From that cup, the goblet of my wrath, you will never drink again. And it's interesting. One point in the story of Nathan coming to David to expose his sin was Nathan said to him, you have been forgiven. You will not bear the wrath of judgment. And God takes this cup of wrath out of David's hand because he's going to hand it to his son. Mm -hmm. Revelation 14.10 tells us what happens to those who reject Christ and have to take that cup of wrath in the last day of judgment. But it will tell us what happens to Christ. He must drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. And he will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur. Do you know that Christ went through hell's fire? from Gethsemane to the cross and to the grave for you and for me. He literally drank to the dregs, dry, the cup of God's wrath. Can you imagine why he was so pressed, why he sweat drops of blood? We say, well, he didn't want to be separated from his father. He didn't want to go through the physical torture that he was about to go through. That's all true. But what pushed him to the brink, what caused him to sweat blood as that olive was crushed to the last degree was this cup. The cup of God's wrath for every sin you have ever committed. Every sin, every person from Adam and Eve through all of time has ever committed. And that cup is filled to overflowing and he had to take it and drink it dry. That's what drove him in that Gethsemane moment. And I don't want to forget that this week as I worship the Lord. And then I want you to see there are two betrayals. David's going to have a betrayal in his story, and Jesus is going to have a betrayal in his. Ziba, a greedy servant, betrays David in Gethsemane for his own gain with fawning affection. We hear this story in 2 Samuel 16, 1 through 4. In the same way, Judas, a greedy disciple, betrays Jesus in Gethsemane for his own gain, 30 pieces of silver, with fawning affection. Mark 14, 43 through 45 tells us, Judas walks up to Jesus and says, Hail, Rabbi. It means I'm so glad to see you. And he kissed him. The Greek verb is emphatic and repetitive. He enthusiastically embraced Jesus and kissed him again and again and again. That's the betrayal that Jesus went through. David first, in detail, tracing what Jesus would do. And then I want you to see there were two beloved sons. Two beloved sons. David will lose a son to sin. And God will lose a son to sin. As David's begotten son with Bathsheba dies, though innocent. And God's begotten son dies, though innocent. 2 Samuel 12 and John 3, 16. And then there are two rebellious sons. And we will wrap up the story today this way. Because then we will go to the cross together next time. And we will sit and savor what the Lord did. Two beloved sons and two rebellious sons. So let's look at it. Absalom, a son of the father, David, led an insurrection, stealing the kingdom and murdering his own brother. And David bore the guilt of his rebellion, a consequence of his own sin. Well, this is where Barabbas enters the story of Jesus in Holy Week. Barabbas, whose name means son of the father, led an insurrection, trying to steal the kingdom and murdering, and Jesus would die in his place, bearing the guilt of his rebellion and the consequence of his sin. So as you consider all that we've looked at today, and particularly that last picture in living color, I want to ask you this. Have you reflected on your rebellion? Because that is what sin is. 
and have you received the gift of the sacrifice of God's beloved Son for you? Because that is what salvation is. Every time we dig deeper into the details of salvation's story, wonder awaits. From creation to the cross, I hope you have seen more clearly that Yeshua, Joshua, your salvation marched forward to conquer sin and death for you. I pray that you'll always start at Friday before Good Friday at that Jericho walk and that you will be so encouraged with all that Christ marched into in order to conquer sin and death for you. Like Cecil B. DeMille's two movies of the Ten Commandments, two scripture stories interwoven, one old in black and white, one new in living color. May you experience the wonder of rediscovering Holy Week as we have dug up and brushed off some pieces of the old, old story in a backdrop <clears throat> long buried and have seen an even greater story to tell, one that will last for all time and eternity. And let me just say this to you as we close today. We tend to speed through the events of Holy Week on our way to Easter, as if Easter is the main event. But the Lord has left us so much here to slow down and savor. So reflect, remember, and renew your heart for him this week in these very places. May you be filled with worship as you see Christ with fresh eyes today and every day to come until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we are so overwhelmed with the story in detail from Genesis to Revelation, an incredible love story that unfolds of you getting us back to the garden again. You would stop, stop at nothing in order to see that happen. And today you are continuing to march forward as Yeshua, Joshua, conquering uh, in our lives, tearing down walls that shouldn't be there, dealing with the brokenness that we have brought because of the stubbornness, the donkey stubbornness of our own sin, the Lamb of God who would drink dry that cup of wrath for every sin that we have thought and done. Father, may this week we focus in a new way, and may we ask ourselves these questions of reflection. May we walk worthy of the gospel that you have entrusted to us. Father, and may you continue to show us as we open your word that wonder awaits. Father, bring it to life in us in a way that will cause everyone who sees us to know Jesus is Lamb and Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.